the indie bio um and i think you know we're many of us are here for kind of a shared reason and this this map is you know one representation of that as we think about climate change and and looking to solve that through you know a really wide range of industries and solutions and one of the you know drivers of this obviously we can look at this chart of population increase and as uh coming from the more industry side a little bit we think about how do we provide food energy clothing education um an opportunity for you know a huge growing number of people around the world and do that in a way that uh isn't pushing our planetary boundaries too much and isn't extracting more than we're giving back um and that's kind of the basis of the problems we're trying to solve and at the same time as a result of this uh this is a, a chart a couple of years ago someone on my team kind of estimated together we look at the growth in the global economy all these industries you know that are huge now whether food and agriculture construction chemicals you know, transportation all that um are going to be increasing you know doubling if not more within you know near decades so uh as we look at that all these kind of the confluence of all these trends and one of the th things we talk a lot about is um to use you know language of biology like what is the mutation rate of industry how are people adapting and that's typically done through research and development and unfortunately in many cases big industry the the multinational players are spending more money on marketing to talk about how they're changing than they actually are spending to change and to evolve so um in my view and i think you know my organization we, we look at startups and kind of this translation from um basic research and discovery that happens primarily in academic institutions um and we think for that to really have an impact on the world it's less likely to be through large companies and more likely through the formation of, of startups and entrepreneur um entrepreneurs um and one of the things we think about um and have why we focused on biotech starting six years ago is kind of a unique moment in history that has happened, I think, across a lot of sciences, not just biology, um, where there's a, a term a friend of ours coined the postocalypse, where there are fewer and fewer professorships being granted and more and more PhDs and postdocs. And, you know, people were sticking around for longer in a postdoc and seeing that that route was maybe uh, shrinking in possibility, then industry was one route. And then is there, you know, a third way to go um, at the same time? There is faster science with a lot more tools and the tools are also being democratized and becoming much cheaper. Resulting in just generally, even in biotech, this chart on the bottom right, the number of patents is increasing pretty dramatically all around the world. Uh, in biology specifically, we think of kind of one change that I think applies to scientists all over. Uh, this idea of read, write, copy, paste, and learn. Uh, so as these tools that we think of very much in the IT and you know computer science sense become more available for for scientists. Uh, what it really drives is the ability to do more iterative cycles and have more hypotheses. So someone who maybe had you know a fifty year career decades ago and could test you know ten big ideas in that time just to make up a random number, now due to the speed and all these new tools, maybe can test instead of ten, fifty, or a hundred different ideas. Um, and that just really increases the rate of learning and growth and almost a surface area for serendipity for great discoveries to happen. Uh, and when it comes to translating that, um, there is this gulf that, that you know, we want to fit into and we see is really needed um, between SBIR and academia, um, which has both capital constraints and certain mindsets and pressures and incentives, and then true institutional venture capital of, you know, raising a seed round of $3 million plus, um, the preparation and funding is kind of missing. Um, and it's been growingly getting filled in. Um, but we saw in biology and hard sciences, uh, it's still, you know, a gulf there. And, you know, IndieBio came in and as Manu said, the goal is to, you know, build transformative companies in human and planetary health. The business model is an accelerator, roughly four months with some changes due to COVID, of course. Um, and for that, we we're giving companies mentorship, uh, I'd say community and network, uh, as much as we can access to lab space to be actually doing building and then funding, which is a, a quarter million dollars and 
recently bumped up with the option of going to half a million dollars in initial funding for uh, a team and an idea. And you know, on the right uh, is a picture of, of Uma Valetti, the founder of Memphis Meats, the world's first uh, cultured meat company. And you know, someone who started out really as the first company in this, in this space and has become a leader of a, a very large movement, um, both in the popular media as well as investment in industry. So in terms of you know, what IndieBio is, I'll try and run through this quickly. Um, it's based off of three kind of rejected, uh, what we would say is rejected conventional thought. Uh, that funding biotech, and I think this applies to deep tech in general, has to be expensive. Um, we actually think you can take an iterative, more kind of lean startup approach to give small milestone driven um, amounts of money and let people de-risk the company that way. Uh, there was this idea in the past, I think that scientists are now entrepreneurs, that they invent something, give it to tech transfer, or give it to some business people who are going to build a company around it. And uh, I think that, you know, the the process of, of, you know, getting a PhD or a master's or really learning the scientific method really does apply and translate very well to the world of, of entrepreneurship. And lastly, the scope of these technologies, you know, in bio specifically, therapeutics was, to, was where it was seen, but uh, we think it can really impact the world in almost any industry. So we funded 140 plus companies in the last five-ish years. They've raised, at this point, the number is probably a, quite a bit higher than one and a quarter billion dollars. And the, what's important to us is really that about two thirds of the companies are raising money. So it's around repeatability and helping a lot of people succeed as opposed to just one or two companies out of 100 who are doing well and driving all the numbers. In terms of the people, um, we recruit companies from all around the world with over 40 in origin. I think the founders represent 100 plus companies in origin really. Um, over 40% of the companies have female founders. Um, I think there's been an increase in uh, drive for representation, which is something that we definitely think about and, and hopefully are trying to do our part in. The age range is super, super broad. Um, I think there is no prototypical entrepreneur. The youngest is around 18. I think 72, I'm not even sure if that's the oldest at this point, but we've had people, yeah, starting companies in their seventies. And then almost every single team has at least one PhD or postdoc. So very often it's both, both founders are, are scientists by training. Uh, the, the model during COVID became hybrid and for virtual, what was normally in person, but really a focus on uh, product-driven science, um, doing being done in conjunction with, you know, doing business, having conversations, understanding and learning the problems and needs of the market, and helping that inform your product development. A lot of work on storytelling and, and raising capital. So from the beginning to the end of that process, as well as the intangibles of of helping uh, scientists kind of make the jump into a hybrid entrepreneur and learning leadership skills, building a culture for a company and creating a, a broader movement in public. This is all based on repeatability. So how can you essentially in this in this graph, we're trying to you know, show how do you compress your cycles of, of testing and learning to be able to adapt and you know, evolve in the market as opposed to going the way of the dinosaur as a company by being too slow. We offer lab and building space, um, which is just part of the standard package and also an ecosystem of investors, corporates, uh, government, industry, um, mentors, and all that stuff. And I'm going to run through a little bit just some examples of areas that we, you know, fund and some, some I hope, exciting companies for people to learn about. Um, we talk about diversity of both the people as well as the ideas. I think almost every industry can be affected. Um, as mentioned, uh, food is probably where we've had, you know, the biggest impact, we have over 40 plus companies across the food system. Uh, we have the first companies making, uh, you know, milk without the cow, egg without the chicken, meat, fish without the animals, um, people doing plant-based products, whether plant-based milk or mayonnaise or ice cream, uh, bacon or others. Uh, one of the interesting areas is um, DNA data storage and computation. So this is one where, uh, using actually encoding information to DNA, you can really work around a number of the big problems in, in data storage where uh, the density in DNA is over a million times greater than anything we have now. 
um, the storage for it, it can last longer than any technology we have. And the, uh, also the amount of energy you have to use to do that and, and replicate it is actually very, very easy. Um, agriculture, as I mentioned, is a big one. I think um, it's a really challenging space due to kind of few very large incumbents, uh, challenges with people just staying in business and, and thin margins, um, making innovation, uh, making people more wary for innovation, more conservative. Um, but we definitely have seen a lot of really interesting uh, applications here, whether um, companies working on pollination and bee health, so both making bees healthier, as well as increasing crop yields, making alternatives to chemical fertilizer and pesticides using biologics and, and bacteria, uh, working on making carbon neutral beef uh, by eliminating methane emissions uh, from the cow, uh, as well as, you know, another actually very recent one that just entered our program using uh, machine learning to predict uh, genotype to phenotype to be able to do crop breeding and understand what's happening in the field much, much faster. Uh, materials and fashion is actually an area we've been looking at quite a bit. Um, it's a really polluting industry. So this is a leather jacket made by Microworks. Um, it's one of the largest companies in the world using mycelium uh, to replace animal leather. Uh, and they're have it announced, but working with a couple of the you know, biggest clothing and shoe companies in the world. Another area that we've recently been, been jumping into more is actually plant biology, uh, specifically looking at, there's a, a whole host of really um, high value compounds that uh, are oftentimes grown in monoculture, take a very long time to be produced. Um, so there are companies working on growing plant stem cells to actually produce these products at a really high purity and actually enable that land to be used for other purposes. And then another even more recent area that is one that we think is really important, uh, but is highly challenging is construction. So this is a picture of uh, one of the first bench prototypes of a company that is looking at uh, taking in CO2 emissions alongside uh, different, different mineral, mineral rocks and actually uh, capturing CO2 into cement through a process that is increasing heat pressure using UV, using UV light to take what happens over many, many years in nature and compressing it down to hours. And lastly, kind of showing here uh, a company actually called MemBio out of uh, Waterloo, Canada, that's looking at um, building a bioreactor to make blood, uh, universally accepted donor blood outside the human body for what is actually a very big shortage and, and big need in, in healthcare. And I'm gonna highlight some, some companies related to the ocean because I know that's what kind of unites this group. Um, it's an area that I, as I said at the top, I think I'd love to see a, a lot more innovation and things happening, but it's definitely moving along and the last year and change has even really started evolving. So first, uh, a company in the feed space called Novo Nutrients, um, Brad's worked with as well, taking in CO2 emissions uh, plus hydrogen uh, to make single cell protein using a community of bacteria. And this is first being looked at for aquaculture feed. Um, and one of the exciting things is they actually have a partnership uh, in Asia with a, a cement a cement plant to build their first scale up unit um, to actually demonstrate they can capture, I think their, the first unit will be 50,000 tons of CO2 to make 20,000 tons of high value product. Um, polymers is another area. Algae Knit is a company using uh, algae, as you could guess probably, to make threads and, uh, and polymers and looking at shoes as a first application for it. Uh, Finless Foods was the first company in the world uh, to do cell-based um, seafood. And they're starting with bluefin tuna. And they both have uh, lab-grown fish that they've structured to sashimi, as well as uh, plant-based products that have the texture and performance and feel that they're hopefully going to market with uh, within the next 12 months. One that's in a slightly different category um, is Blue Planet Ecosystems. They're building uh, kind of their own version of vertical farms. And here, the idea is to have multiple layers in the ecosystem of uh, algae, zooplankton, and then shrimp or fish at the bottom. And the goal here is to actually use areas of the world that have a lot of sunlight, but non-arable land, and use that, that free energy to actually be building the ecosystem that will become local, mercury-free, microplastic-free, uh, nutritious protein. Uh, New Way Foods is a company doing plant-based shrimp. 
they recently actually uh, got a big investment led by Tyson Ventures to, to scale that and bring it to market. Um, and lastly, I'll highlight a company it's, it's quite early on uh, called Agracy that's working on engineering rice to be salt tolerant to the point that it can grow in the ocean on these kind of mocked up here, uh, small floating uh, farms that people would be able to, to harvest um, intermittently. And also potentially in areas that have salt water infiltration on land, um, have seeds that are viable and can grow um, in those regions. So just to talk a little bit about, um, we, we give a lot of talks um, in academia with groups of PhDs and postdocs. And we get asked a lot, like, what are the differences um, between academia and industry and startups? So I'm gonna run through that quickly. Certainly not a perfect analysis and I'll be curious if people have thoughts on it. Um, so first, when we look between being an industry or, or a PI, um, we think about independence. So as a professor, typically a lot more scientific independence in an industry. You're leading a group as opposed to being part of a team, likely under management. Um, the amount of peer interaction probably is different. Um, in academia, probably a smaller subset than industry where you're going across teams and across domain expertise. Um, the funding model, certainly very different grants and by revenue. Um, one thing I think that drives a lot of people towards academia is you see the impact of your ideas in the discovery and the research that you're doing, whereas an industry might be a smaller piece of a very large pie. And then the reward, uh, probably starting a bit lower in academia, but going up in an industry starting relatively good. And their work-life balance, uh, probably a little bit worse than academia, um, depending on what company you might work for. And then we think about how, how startups compare to these. Um, and this is actually why we think startups are relatively good for people who have academic history in a lot of ways. Um, you have a lot of scientific independence, you're driving that you're, as, as a leader of your company. Um, what is like industry is the amount of interaction. You're going very broad between hiring people, talking to investors, press, going to conferences. So there's learning to adapt your messaging to many, many different people. The funding is different, typically by investors early on. Uh, you definitely see the impact um, from every idea you have to you know picking up garbage on the floor in your lab to hiring people. Every decision can really drive impact. Uh, the reward starts out very, very small. If I had half a dollar sign, I'd probably put it there. Um, and then if you succeed, it can be much greater and then work-life balance likely, especially early on is, you know, startups take a lot of time, a lot of energy, you know, have a lot of intensity. And when we think about scientists to entrepreneurs as well, the transferable skills, I think are really critical. Um, all these to, to succeed in academia, I think you need all these things and more. So this isn't even all encompassing, um, but being a quick learner, a quick thinker, being very resourceful, being able to persist on a, on a problem for a long time and see it from many angles and uh, test around that. And startup skills, um, perhaps were developed in academia, perhaps not, um, especially around leadership. I think that's a big one. Um, persuasion and selling, which can be a dirty word in academia, but is part, part of getting an idea out there is having, you know, someone has to buy it and adopt it. Uh, storytelling, so crafting your message uh, product driven thinking and product uh, driven science, as well as passion. So I would say these four can, can very much be learned. Uh, passion kind of, I think, can't so much be taught, but it, it has to kind of come from, you know, caring about what you're doing. And for us, we have, we have five questions that kind of are the core that drive how we talk to companies. Um, first is what is the technical insight that gives you an unfair advantage? Um, I think everything is driven by science that we do. Um, so at the very core fundamental level, how are we approaching a problem in a very new or unique way? Um, and can that science become a product? So is it really translatable into something tangible? Is there a business model that can be formed around it, which can be a challenge in a lot of areas. I think we talk a lot about, especially ocean climate solutions, um, who's gonna pay for these things? It's a, it's a huge challenge still to be figured out. Um, but one's probably a bottleneck. Um, for us, we always look at, can it touch the lives of ideally a billion, a, a billion people or make a billion dollars that the latter part of that, uh, for better or worse in the world of venture capital, people are looking at probably billion dollar ideas because they're so risky and so many fail. 
and most critically is, is a team. So always orienting around who are the people behind this idea. And very quickly, I'll, I'll just highlight for anyone here thinking about a startup, um, five very frequent uh, startup pitfalls that we see at the very early stages to potentially avoid. Um, first is as you're translating, we see a lot of companies that, that want to continue writing grants and thinking of grants as kind of validation or proof points. And I think um, grants can be really useful. There are definitely many companies that have relied on grants for part of their development, but they are really a long way um, from, from market traction and from getting a signal that you're solving the problem for people who are willing to pay. So there's a, a vastly um, there's a vast difference between a government agency or someone you know using their budget to write a grant and someone using their revenue or opening their wallet to pay for something. So it's something we always orient teams around. Even if you're writing a grant, you have to be touching the market, getting LOIs, getting partnerships, JVs, um, even from the very earliest stages when you're pre-product. The other is not going full time. Um, a startup is is judged by the people who are full time on the team. Um, so, and part of this is, is risk. Um, if someone, you know, if companies are getting investment money, those investors are always looking at, is someone really taking a risk and do they believe in this idea to, you know, we talk about both are the right people on the bus and something internally, you know, half jokingly called the bus test. Um, if the people who are on this team full time on this team, um, if someone gets hit by a bus, can the startup still keep going? And if it can, then maybe those aren't the right people. You need people who are, especially in the early stages, um, they're all providing something critical to that company and really core to that DNA. The other um, build it and they will come mentality. Um, that's one, you know, happens very frequently uh, where when there's a great idea and, and the per perception of a problem in the world um, and climate change is a very real problem, but very broad. Um, this idea of, of building something perfect in the lab before testing it um, can be uh, a big failing point for a lot of companies, which ties into very much the idea of, of building prototypes and getting very quick and dirty. Um, the picture here is actually from a company doing food safety testing. They had a technology in the lab that could uh, capture and uh, very quickly detect RNAs from the three most common food pathogens. They spent months getting it perfect in the lab and we told them you, you have to go to a kitchen or, or talk to a customer and, and figure out like, do they care about this? Does this work? Like how will you actually run the process in, in real time? So they spent $20 to buy a few tubes, some brushes and sponges, 3D print a container, went to the, the kitchen of a food company in the Bay Area. And they found that uh, the actual sponges they were using to swab different areas of the kitchen uh, uh, weren't releasing the genetic material properly into, into their solutions that they were running through in the test tube. So they spent months building what they thought was a perfect process and not realizing that it didn't even function in the actual real world. And then as they started solving for that and talking to more customers, they realized that the real problem they had to solve was actually training and automation. So customers didn't want to have to hire technicians or people who had scientific background. They needed to build an automated unit that was all encompassing. And the company took months and spent a lot of money uh, without realizing that. And lastly, uh, in the structure of a company, you know, a cap table, which is you know, where the equity is going. Um, a lot of times uh, companies might put too much of this out and, and not think of a proper structure. So we see a, a really common, easy, easy format for companies with 10% of an ESOP, which is an option pool to give to new employees and hires. Um, for a lot of companies spinning out of academia for with um, PIs who aren't full-time on the company, a maximum of 5% equity, roughly equal split for the people who are full-time and then having a plan or license for the technology from, from the company or from the university, I should say. Cool. Um, that is all for me. So I'm going to stop sharing. And hopefully uh, people have questions or want to talk about it. Thank you. A round of applause. So that was, uh, I found very interesting to me, but I'd like um, to have a bit of a Q and A among ourselves. And then if there's interest, we can go in some breakout groups. Uh, if you could all please turn your video cam, if you have it, so that we could just sort of have a feel of being together. Um, and um, who wants to go with some questions?
Okay. Maybe I'll start. Uh, I, I have a question, Manu, if you don't mind. So, Alex, thanks for the talk. Great talk. What do you think are some of the most um, high opportunity applications of biotech and, uh, and synthetic biology into the challenges in the oceans? Do you have any, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, I'm just wondering if you've given that some thought. I know we've talked a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, I think the one that's probably the most, in terms of right now, has kind of uh, hype in the investment and in, in community of like industry and corporates is definitely around, you know, aquaculture and food, food feed production. So um, finding ways to build products that maybe are, you know, free of exploiting the oceans. That's a lot of like plant-based or cell-based foods um, or even ways of, you know, making feed or upcycling, you know, waste from other industries to make feed. Um, so we don't have to pull out, you know, billions of small fish to feed other fish. I think that's a, one that's getting a lot of attention um, and a lot of investment dollars. Uh, the other is because it has captured, I think the public's imagination so much is plastics. Um, and we see a lot of applications in the bio for a new bioplastic, um, you know, people working on a single polymer, using bacteria to make precursors and all that. Um, the challenge there is always, um, if you're making a product that can only really get revenue when it's at commodity prices, there's that, that gap of, of scale up that still, you know, some companies have polymers that are gonna be used in other industries that is helpful. But I think that's one where I think either it really needs industry to, to come in and help scale much earlier and put money to work or government has to be, you know, providing some of those facilities or some way to bridge that gap. Um, I think in some of the further out solutions, Brad, uh, one area that people have been investing in and some new companies have formed, it has been um, offshore, you know, kelp and seaweed cultivation. Uh, there's still a lot, there's basic science to be done at the same time as there's uh, engineering challenges to solve and how do you build these free floating structures. But I think that's one, the other that is, seems pretty tractable to entrepreneurs, whereas uh, things around, you know, uh, you know, weathering and kind of how do we deal with acidification is still, seems to be pre, pre, pre-commercial. Mm. I have a question. Um, so in terms of like how someone gets their company started, like from the very beginning, are these people that are coming to you just people that are like PhD? They like they have PhDs. They come to you with an idea, and they're like, "Please give us money," and you just give yeah. them money and have them, and and they you fund their research. Or is that like I guess how does that usually work for you guys? Yeah, um, so it's a mix. Uh, we have a lot of just inbound applications. We also you know do visits that used to be in person. Now it's a little bit easier to go abroad. Um, uh, to universities to meet scientists. And there's everything from people who have, you know, prototypes and early proof of concept and work they've been doing maybe somewhat commercially. Uh, we've had definitely many companies apply with an idea for, with some scientific underpinnings for it, why it's kind of, why it's, uh, what I'd say, engineering and not basic scientific discovery. Um, that's kind of the key, I would say. And some of those are actually, at this point, our most advanced companies, like uh, one that just had a big announcement yesterday, Clara Foods, they're making um, egg white protein without the chicken. They came with literally an idea on a piece of paper. It was one scientist and one you know, CEO who wasn't a scientist and they launched their first uh, animal free protein onto the market yesterday. Um, after five years, raised $50 million on that. So um, it's something that we, I wouldn't say this is the norm, but like our team, we have a technical team that can evaluate science um, we like ideas that are out there and crazy to some extent. Um, so we we're fine with ideas. So what happens, sorry, I'm just going to stop. So what happens if it doesn't work? Like what if like, you know, they realize this is like not a good idea. And then it, like your company put in however many thousands of whatever dollars, like where, like, yeah, what happens? Uh, there's two routes. If that, if you find that out and you run out of money, like, that is part of the world of startups and venture capital. Like we lose money. Like we, we are, 
we know the amount of risks that goes into a startup and that it, not every idea will succeed. I think it's something we talk about pretty openly with the founders. Like, and I think one of the things that, you know, we have a lot of people pre COVID, especially who visited our labs and like talked to us, how do we build an innovation cluster in Brazil or Japan or France or, or wherever? And one of the keys is around culture and mindset, like, especially in the Bay area. And I think this is growing more like failing at an idea is, is not a bad thing. Like there's, there's no shame in that and there's no shame in, in trying for it. So I think that's a key. We, we know that can happen. And when that time comes, we talk to the entrepreneur and they might make a decision to shut down. The other is, you know, people pivot ideas in crazy ways. And I'll give one example um, that can sometimes be in this talk. I didn't highlight it. We had a company in our first batch working on um, essentially making cheaper stem cells for academic research. So they had a way to differentiate and make mesenchymal stem cells. Um, it was a great technology. It was way, way cheaper. But they found that selling into academia took too long and people didn't really care about that cost savings. And they were down to like their last fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. And the, the technical co-founder was in Napa Valley. And he saw on and this one winery, this like $10,000 bottle of who knows, like 90, you know, 1915, whatever wine. And he was just thinking to himself, I don't know how this came to mind. He's like, I could figure out what's in that and make that at home. I can make that in my lab. So they went and they uh, essentially rebuilt an exotic wine from the, from the ground up, molecule by molecule by analyzing it, pre-sold it, and then raised two and a half million dollars off it. And now that company is called Endless West. They make wine, sake, whiskey, um, molecule by molecule, without grapes, without fermentation, without barreling. Um, and when we think about that, it's really valuable for industry in that they can create new formulations kind of on a whim in a way. And it's also very good for the environment. It saves a massive amount of money. Um, you're, you're actually saving a lot of energy and transportation. Um, so that's kind of, you can pivot as well. No one's making you stay with the same idea. Super cool. Thanks, Megan, for asking those questions. Yeah. Does anybody else, please go ahead. Okay. Well, while people are thinking of your next question, no, Denise, did you have a question? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, um, I did. Um, so I guess in terms of investing in companies that are more involved in social entrepreneurship and social initiatives, how do you decide when to invest in these companies so you can kind of balance meeting these social goods versus still meeting kind of like prevailing economic concerns that you could have? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. I think for us, we are, we are, among other things, we are technology investors alongside it. So we, we want to use technology to have a social impact. Um, and I, I think a lot of companies do demonstrate that. So um, there's a lot of great social impact companies that are just not technology driven that wouldn't fit into our specific investment mandate. Um, otherwise, if it has what we think is interesting science and application um, for social good, uh, you know, we'll look at it at any point. So do you have any specific sectors that you have a question about or kind of application areas that, that come to mind? Um, no, I'm more so thinking of sometimes you hear about companies where it's they have a great idea but they kind of enter in the market at the wrong time sort of mm -hmm. idea um, and I'm wondering if that kind of is playing an issue in mm -hmm. this kind of like tech industry or if it's like a good hot market for these type of startups yeah um, timing we do talk about timing being really really critical um, there's actually uh, two prime examples and they're companies that are both raising money right now um, one was the company that I mentioned around pollination. And for them, it's both timing uh, and understanding because there aren't a lot of people who invest in agriculture um, and there's no venture capital, essentially in bees specifically. Um, but their timing was good enough where uh, there was enough care about sustainability and bee health in particular, the colony collapse that it kind of drove a lot of awareness. So they were able to raise money and, and get partners really well there's another um, working on making, you know, the tagline is wood without trees. So using waste fibers from different um, plants and uh, fashioning that into furniture or panels and other things. And we're kind of 
talking internally and this is like a half joke half truth like do we think in like 10 or 20 years it's going to be illegal to chop down trees and like if that's the case this company is going to be worth like an incredible amount of money if they can make these materials without trees but um can you as a company survive until that right time like when the market really cares and they found pull in other ways but uh timing is is huge see leslie you have your hand up please go ahead yes thank you and let me see if I can put my hand down so I don't forget later. Uh, first, I've, I've lived most of the uh, bins that you talked about and you really nailed it, what the pluses and minuses are of academia versus industry versus your own startup. Um, we have, uh, we're a nonprofit and we work on restoring Arctic ice. So, and, and that's something that we haven't figured out how or if one should make a for-profit Totally. Um, I think it would get in the way of, of a lot of what we're trying to do, but there are for-profit spin-offs. Would somebody like us be somebody who should approach you? And, and for-profit spin-offs like, you know, helping with fisheries or helping with, with water conservation. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not biology per se, but you've got the vision that sounds very akin. How, what, what would your choices be? What would your advice be for people like us? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I think I'll speak for my team as well. I mean, we'd love to talk. I think that's a, it is like a grand challenge of humanity, whether or not the, you know, polar ice aspect itself is something that should be, and is like a venture backable is arguable. I, I think if there's a great enough story, hopefully enough governments and philanthropists step up to like an obviously really, really critical challenge for humanity. Um, I think in terms of spin outs, yeah, I, I, there is always a question of like, I don't know your technology well enough to know how it impacts those industries. If, if you're kind of hitting at being a, a widget versus like kind of a, a larger solution. Um, so I think that, that could be the question, um, whether it's something that as a nonprofit, maybe the nonprofit that spins out these startups is licensing technology to large you know, aquaculture companies and that helps you pay for your work actually in the Arctic, I'm not sure. Versus about that a lot. Yeah, I yeah. don't want to commandeer this whole meeting, yeah. but I was just curious to see. So, I'll, yeah, I mean, we'd love to. We'd love to chat. Um, so, can, I, can yeah. I ask a question? Sorry, I was really curious. One of the struggles I posed so last week, I was watching this documentary about this idea that the Dutch government is having on creating a big green island offshore that is powered by a farm of, uh, of wind turbines, and then they want to produce, you know, you know, green fuels like hydrogen and so forth. And, and that stuck me because, you know, sometimes, you know, you really want to solve some problems at scale. And maybe these problems at scale is not just a single startup coming up with an idea, but it's really an ecosystem of ideas that coalesce together to give you really a punch for your, and, and my sense is that you know, all these startup worlds and these new companies, it's a great, it's great to have this, but how do we at some point really leverage this collection of ideas into an ecosystem of solutions that towards, you know, one of these bigger problems? I mean, that's, that's something I, I struggle with thought in my thought process. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's something we struggle with every day as well. Um, you know, one, one industry that's an example, as opposed to a geography is, is agriculture. You know, we see a lot of really interesting companies applying with, you know, different ways to get rid of chemicals in industry, different way, you know, the pollination company, ones on methane and cows, and it's a really hard area to raise money. It's a hard area to get early partnerships and, and kind of get that, you know, we are crossing one valley of death, but there's more valleys of death after that. Um, so is it government kind of intervention incentives? Are there unique kind of funding methods that kind of wrap all these solutions together. One thing we've talked about, I don't know if anyone's followed it, there's like this been a boom of uh, SPACs, which is a different way for companies to go public. Um, so it's like, should something like that package, you know, eight different really interesting agriculture ideas together with everything from, you know, soil carbon monitoring and, and soil health to solutions for crop, you know, crop additives, maybe some soil microbiome things and, and make that to one large company. Maybe that's one way to do it. Um, I think then, you know, relying on proactive government around these things is, is very dangerous to survive. Uh, 
at times that you know the EU is progressive in certain ways. Singapore actually, um, in terms of their food tech ecosystem, we've talked to them for years. That is a place that's small enough, the government is nimble enough and driven that they've built a food tech ecosystem in two to three years. Um, but in the US with all the regulatory hurdles and politics involved, I, I, I hesitant to rely on that. So it is kind of unique business models or funding sources uh, oftentimes. So um, typically we have breakout group discussions, but I thought this Q&A was very interesting for the broader group. Uh, so I didn't open the breakout groups and, and you know, there's really not a lot of time for breakout groups. So uh, if, if, if we guys wanna go forward and have a few more questions, we can do that. Um, and I think it's probably the most valuable use of our time. So please go ahead if you have other questions. Alex, I have a question. Um, you know, on your last slide, you talked about the equity structure for one of these startups. And what I didn't see was like, what's the plan for when you need to seek additional outside capital and then you'll have to dilute the, you know, you'll have to dilute the equity. So who, who gets diluted? What do you typically recommend there? Like, how does all that work? Yeah, yeah. So um, when it comes to like raising the next rounds, that will, you know, be the issuance of, of, you know, more shares in the company. And if you say take in $5 million for 25% of the company, everyone's going to kind of get that haircut of 25%. Um, so if a founder had 40, it'll, it'll cut down to 30 and, you know, on and on and on, it'll waterfall that way. Um, I think typically what's important there is, is you know, one of the guidelines that, that we tend to use, and I think is pretty common in the Bay Area, is that both is looking at um, fitting the, the timeline of a startup as well as the most VCs look at this business model. So if you're looking at VC funding, it's typically uh, enough money for roughly 18 months of runway and hitting specific milestones that are next up for the company. And that's in exchange for, in the early stages, probably 20 to 30% of the company on average. Um, if you're in a hot space with like a, a great team um, and you have competing offers, you can probably get on the lower end of that range. Um, we do talk about, you know, first rule we tell of our startups is don't die as a company. Second rule, get the best deal you can. So the exact amount of dilution is going to going to vary a little bit by by that. And that's an area where it does become very tempting. And, and it's really rational to look at grants as a way to preserve equity in the company. Um, and it can totally make sense in certain times. I think there it's uh, you don't want to become a, a grant like a grant writing startup entirely because um, at some point your technology readiness level is gonna probably be beyond where grant writers are, are looking to give you money. And then if you go to you know, funders and they just look at this as kind of an academic lab that is in a different, different structure, you probably, it'll be challenging to get the money to take that next step to meet the market in a way. Um, go ahead. Well, I think you're on mute, Tom. Hey, Tom, we can't hear you. Sorry, the uh, Alex, can you hear me now? The uh, great yeah. talk. Uh, the question about the SPACs: If um, how how has this recent increase in SPAC activity affected like Indie Bios operations? <laughs> um, I shouldn't have brought up SPACs. We we have not done a SPAC. Um, I won't claim to be an expert in this by any stretch either. We've been approached by people who've talked a bit about it. Um, uh, and there's a lot of, when it comes to both, you know, the federal government, like printing money right now and inflation, all that, I'm not a macroeconomist or an expert there. It's like where the tailwinds are really blowing. So um, it's definitely something that some of our companies who are a little bit later on are looking at, um, but we haven't really engaged too much. Okay. Well, uh, there are any more questions for today? Well, uh, I just opened up chat, Virginia. Uh, oh, I sorry. Saw your question about I'm how sorry. I, my background in getting involved in any bio. Um, so, definitely some serendipity, a lot of serendipity in that. Um, I actually went to grad school for clinical pharmacy because I have a PharmD and um, 
personally had a lot more interest in behavioral health and preventive medicine, uh, not super into giving pills for things, um, which is pretty much the, you know, going to pharmacy school is the wrong place for that. But maybe I realized a little bit too late. Um, so, you know, I had a bit of a winding road. My two interests were kind of nutrition and health, as well as outside of like countries like the US access to medicine, spent a little bit of time in nonprofits in uh, DC in global health. Uh, personally, not a fan of bureaucracy and did not stay in that world. Um, also found it to be pretty slow. Tried to do a startup with a few friends around kind of behavior change and behavioral health. Um, learned a lot of lessons the hard way there around behavior and getting people to change. And then um, was also doing some advising and other things within kind of harder sciences and just through serendipity met the, you know, the founder Arvin of IndieBio when it was still a very new accelerator and bio wasn't really being invested in, in the Bay area outside of kind of the old school type of model and joined the team with the idea of sticking around for a year or two and going back into the startup world. And uh, as you know, life would have it, that plan didn't, and I just, you know, that plan didn't happen. I've stayed at Indie bio. Um, I thought it's been just a, a place where I could probably draw, have more impact by helping us, you know, pick and steer towards, you know, companies and areas that I think, you know, we need in the world. So that's been my focus is more and more on how do we get more climate solutions. And I think we've been doing a lot of that. I hope, I hope well. Okay. Well, I guess we have one, one last question by Varun. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, great talk. Uh, my question was around a CV and the, uh, the monetization or sequestration um, that a lot of the companies are, are looking at. Um, so uh, what is your view on that? And is that a, a, an economic business plan or business case that you would look at from a funding standpoint? So we haven't invested into like seaweed. I think, uh, what is it? I think it was someone here from Running Tide, which I believe is doing that. And would probably speak to this much, much better than me. Um, I think... In terms, you know, one of the big questions I'll just be focusing on, and I'm assuming Running Tide and its investors have, is how do you like do really high quality accounting for that um, and have companies that are willing to pay? I think it's kind of, it's a scary business model. It's one that can definitely work, I think, in the new world we're entering with climate change. But most of the seaweed companies we've talked to are people who are looking at using it for kind of you know, food, feed, food, fuel, fiber, and kind of those, those type of applications, um, which are a bit more commodity and, and need some processing and transportation. Uh, I think what's been interesting, I've started to see more and more of companies who are looking at how do we kind of bio mine, so to speak, um, all this, all the, the world of seaweed that we don't know. So how do we cultivate a lot more species? How do we find really high value compounds that are useful for human health and medicine? or additives in food. Um, so I think that's probably, you know, where I think there's, there's just a ton of interesting applications, but I think that's where we're starting to see the direction run a little bit. You know, as an accelerator, um, there are things that in just with business models that can sometimes be challenging. Like if we give a company a quarter million dollars, like is that enough for them to build offshore seaweed farms and kind of get from that zero to one moment? Um, I'm not sure yet. The companies we've talked to have been a little bit beyond our stage. Wow, that was really, truly, you know, a world that uh, for some of us at least is is really new. And so it was great to, to hear about these stories. And to me, one most inspiring also is to see the type of companies in the ocean, uh, you know, landscape that are coming up because they sort of provide an inspiration for sort of a, a you know, a visualization of what it can be. Uh, so thank you so much again, Alex, and thank you, everyone. Another round of applause for Alex. Uh, thank you. I put my email in the chat in case anyone wants to reach out. Please feel free. Perfect. And uh, so next week, uh, um, I have a, a courtesy to ask. Uh, after the, the talk, uh, I wanted to try out uh, a new type of interface uh, to socialize and have our breakout group discussions. Uh, that is one that we are considering uh, to use for the Ocean Vision Summit coming up in May. And so if, if it's okay with you, we're going to use some of you as guinea pigs. 
to, to see what, you know, to get some initial feedback for the community. I, I hope that's going to be okay. So enjoy your weekend. And again, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Hey, David. Hey, Manu. Can you stay for a second. I wanted to share. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to call you after I have a, a call now, unfortunately. Let me call you. Uh, are you available at four? Yeah, that sounds fine. Okay. Anyway, okay. thank you so much for inviting Alex. I, I really enjoyed uh, his talk. Yeah, I think it was mostly it was mostly came from Brad, but I, I agree. I thought he did a great job, especially the kind of back half. Um, yeah. So 